This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. You have found the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. For those who are new to my podcast, I usually take a minute at the beginning of every episode to thank the people who have been generous enough to donate and become patrons. This week, I'm going to do things a bit differently. But first, I have to acknowledge my new patron, Jennifer V. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining this group of amazing friends. I have many other amazing supporters, and we'll mention them at the end of this episode, so please stay tuned because they definitely deserve the recognition. During my continual research of Thomas Seymour, I have come across many letters that he wrote during diplomatic missions. I will be honest, when I first found these letters, I glanced at them and my eyes instantly glazed over. Most of these letters contained what I considered a bunch of military jargon that made little sense to me. It wasn't until very recently that I decided to look at the letters again to help me truly understand who Thomas Seymour was. He wasn't just the fourth son of John and Marjorie Wentworth, or the brother of Queen Jane and Edward Seymour. He was a soldier, a man of the sea, an ambassador to the Low Countries and to the King of Hungary. He was also, by the standards of the mid-16th century, worldly. Thomas had traveled to France, Germany, Austria, and Hungary to name just the ones that I know of for sure. He was, for the most part, well-liked by all. Thomas had the charisma that his brother Edward did not, and the looks that his sister Jane apparently lacked. As I navigated through the passages of these letters, I discovered that Thomas had a flair for the dramatic as well. There's one part where he states, quote, we have lost our boats, end quote, making it appear a little bit worse by not expounding. When reading that line, you get the impression that the ship sank. Quite the contrary, they just veered off course. Thomas had a way of drawing attention to himself, even in letters. It is with all this in mind that I chose to talk about what I believe was Thomas's first mission abroad as ambassador to the King of Hungary. In order to grasp the entire subject of this podcast, I need to start with the Siege of Buddha. This will help a bit to explain why an ambassador was needed in 1542. Before I get started, please note that I'm horrible at reading foreign names and places, and I really do my best to ensure accuracy. (laughs) Also, it might be helpful to look at a map when I describe these places that he traveled to. I use Google Maps, and it really helped the story unfold for me. Do what works for you, of course. If you're driving in the car listening to me right now, I gotta be honest, that's kind of (laughs) cool. Hey. Hey, if you're behind the wheel right now, will you pull over? I really have a lot of cool stories to share with you. And if you're riding shotgun, then just sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to Thomas, the diplomat and the siege of Pest. The siege of Buda lasted from the 4th of May to the 21st of August, 1541, and resulted in the capture of Buda in Hungary by the Ottoman Empire, headed by Suleiman the Magnificent. A little backstory. Ferdinand of Hungary was the ruler of the Austrian hereditary lands of the Habsburgs, and two years before the siege of Buda, his accomplished commander, Wilhelm von Rogendorf, resigned from combat. Well, when it was decided that Ferdinand and his allies would lay siege on Buda, von Rogendorf could not resist a good fight for his master. He threw on his armor and joined the allies, probably in Vienna. The Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire had a lasting feud with one another. Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Suleiman the Magnificent, ruler of the Ottoman Empire, appear to have enjoyed fighting one another for the land in Hungary. Ferdinand in 1541 was the King of Hungary, Bohemia, Germany, Croatia. He was the King of the Romans and Archduke of Austria. Between Ferdinand and his brother, the Emperor, those two ruled most of Europe. By the 16th century, the Ottomans had become a serious threat to the European powers. This siege was nothing new. 
from 1526 to 1568, the Habsburgs and the Ottoman Empire were engaged in a series of campaigns called the Little War of Hungary. That's 42 years of fighting. Am I the only one who thinks that 42 years is far from little? The conflict with Buddha had really begun much, much earlier than that. This was an ongoing battle with the winner often changing. So the Habsburgs claimed it, and then it was taken by the Ottoman Empire. The Habsburgs reclaimed Buddha, and eventually the Ottoman Empire snatched it up again. That's exactly what was happening leading up to the Siege of Buddha. The Ottoman Empire, after claiming Buddha again, decided that they wanted to claim Vienna as well, and would try to use the momentum gained from the victory at Buddha. It did not work, and they were horribly defeated in Vienna. So we're left with both Buddha and Pest in the hands of the Ottoman Empire after the Siege of Buddha. Of course, the Habsburgs could not let this be, and they wanted both Buddha and Pest back in their control. This is when England and Thomas Seymour come into the picture. In June 1542, Thomas Seymour was named ambassador to the court of King Ferdinand of Hungary. A trip to Nuremberg quickly followed, and Thomas was accompanied by Charles Howard. Now, Charles was the brother of the late Catherine Howard, and Thomas the brother of the late Jane Seymour. See a connection there? The trip to Nuremberg would be the beginning of their trip to take part in the expedition against Hungary, or what would later be called the Siege of Pest. It appears from the letters that this ambassador traveled with the Allied troops and discussed any interactions he may have had as ambassador to Hungary. The Allies traveled through Europe until they arrived in Vienna, where it appears they regrouped before heading to their final stop before Buda at Estragon. On the 6th of July, 1542, it was reported that the whole army moved on Buda, so it would take about 10 days from Estragon to get to Buda. Thomas Seymour, in a letter, tells King Henry that there were about 80,000 troops in all of which 6,000 were upon the Danube in boats. Along the way, the army was able to determine that Buda was strongly fortified with 15,000 men. Then on the 10th of July, Thomas wrote to King Henry that his army is camped on the other side of the Danube. Half of the army came across the Danube at a town castle, where the king and queen, as well as lords and ladies, stood for eight or nine hours to see them pass. I've been trying to figure out which castle he's referring to in this letter. I'm assuming that he's referring to the mammoth-sized Buddha castle that lies on the banks of the Danube, but I cannot be certain on the plan of attack. The following day, the rest of the men followed. In the same letter to his king, Thomas explained how the king of Hungary did not intend to besiege Buddha the following day, and that he planned to depart for Nuremberg to meet the council of the empire. So here's Thomas ambassador to Hungary, and he just revealed that the man that the English army was there to assist, the brother to the emperor, and the man that he was supposed to be communicating with for King Henry, was going to abandon the field to go to Nuremberg for a meeting. The plan moving forward was that the army would besiege Pest. If they won the battle, they would fortify it and end the campaign for the year. Once fortified, they would await the instructions of King Ferdinand and the princes of Germany from their meeting in Nuremberg. There was a snag in the plans when the Turks chose not to send their 8,000 footmen, but in their place that they would send 20,000 light horse. Seymour then goes on to explain in his letter that they will, quote, tarry here for five days for pioneers to mend the way, end quote. I love that quote. Tarry here. The scene changed a bit by the time August arrived, still in Hungary. Here's a transcribed letter by Thomas Seymour. News is here so uncertain that he cannot vouch for it. The Turk is coming in person to Buda with 300,000 men, divided in six battles, intending to attack on six sundry days. This army intends, therefore, to track time until the midst of October. For the end of October, the Danube is frozen, so that the Turk cannot bring his victuals by water. If it was certain that the Turk would not come in person, even if he sent 200,000 men, as Baron Hedeke says, they would straight to Pest, which could be taken in three days, and then besiege Buda, which might be battered sufficiently for the assault in eight days. Missing it, they would garrison Pest, Stragon, Rabi, and other strongholds, and retire home for the winter. This enterprise can wait six weeks yet. 
The Turks has lately sent 14,000 men to Buda and Pest, making 32,000 in all. But they are sore punished with the plague, men falling dead as they walk in the streets. Wow, sounds awful, doesn't it? A few days later, after his letter to Henry VIII, the king replied to Thomas Seymour, telling him that he had essentially done his job as ambassador and that his service here is required, and that he shall, upon receipt of this, take leave and return home. So, evidently, Thomas Seymour left Buddha, and he headed back toward Vienna, because that's the next time we hear from him, on the 5th of September, where he updates the progress of the upcoming siege. So the Bishop of Warden sent a man to the King of Hungary and told him that if he will come to Buda in person, that the Bishop will accompany him with 8,000 horses. If he does not come, then neither he nor the 15,000 troops at Estragon will advance. Inevitably, the Siege of Pest was a failure. The Allied armies were led by the seasoned Austrian military leader von Rogendorf. Von Rogendorf was wounded in battle near the end of the siege and died two days later. Had it been the King of Hungary leading his men, the story may have ended a bit differently. King Ferdinand, whatever his reasons, left his battle. Does that seem odd to you? On the 5th of October, Thomas Seymour reported that, quote, after battering a breach, they assaulted Pest, but failed. And afterwards, for lack of wages, the soldiers refused to keep watch and ward or to make assault, end quote. After all the excitement in Hungary, Thomas Seymour was sent back under the order of the king to Nuremberg. There, he had more discussions and negotiations with other German ambassadors who said that they would not fight for the emperor, but they could find men who would. As stated previously, the Siege of Pest was an utter failure, and the Ottoman Empire ruled there for another 150 years. Before doing all of this research, I did not really know much about Ferdinand of Hungary. Once I discovered he was the brother of the Holy Roman Emperor, it all made a little bit more sense. Picture this, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. Are you imagining that long chin that's synonymous with the Habsburgs? The long jaw, long chin. Now, if you need to stop and Google him right now, <laughs> please go ahead. I'll wait. Okay, I think I waited long enough. <laughs> so you picture that. Now, picture his brother, Ferdinand of Hungary. He's just like a younger version of Charles, but about, you know, he's about three years younger. He doesn't appear to have the strong chin of the Habsburgs, but definitely has the long jaw. Now, if you look at their portraits side by side, you'll really, really notice the similarities in that they're brothers. They were the sons of Philip I and Juana of Castile. Now, if you remember, or if you know your Tudor history, Juana is actually the sister of Catherine of Aragon. Juana is the one that they call, you know, Mad Juana. Quiz time. Now, I wrote a blog a while ago about Philip of Castile and Henry, Prince of Wales. It was about how Philip had made quite an impression on the young prince. When Henry was notified of his role model's death in 1506, he was really saddened about it and said it, quote, appeared to reopen a wound which time had begun to heal. What wound was he referring to? If you said Elizabeth of York, his mother, you were correct. Isn't that a fun little piece of history there? Anyway, now that I'm done quizzing you. The Tudor's Dynasty podcast would not be possible without the generous support of the following patrons. I promise that at the end of this episode, I would thank all of my patrons because honestly, without these people, this would not be able to continue. So I really wanted to give them a shout out. So let's start again with Jennifer V, Shelby, Sari, Christopher, Suke, Johanna, Doris, Courtney, Anastasia, Anna, Bob, Diana, Rachel, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa S., Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan B., Pat B., and Heather of the English Renaissance History Podcast. So if you listen to this episode and you'd like to become a patron, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click Become a Patron. 
For as little as a dollar a month, you can show your support. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. Until next time. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.